Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Dr. Claudia Sonder and I'm the president of the Napa Community Animal Response Team or CART and an equine veterinarian. As a CART team member, you may be requested to perform a head to tail assessment on a horse in your care, whether out in the field or in the shelter. This video is designed to give you some of the skills and knowledge that you may need to accomplish that task safely. Today, we'll review safe handling and safety zones around the horse, obtaining vitals, assessing hydration. We'll talk about some of the common injuries that you'll see in a disaster situation, give you some skills for light first aid and controlling of bleeding, talk about some of the situations under which we would not want to load a horse if we had the time to stabilize its condition, and also talk about ways to include the veterinarian in your decision making. Whenever I'm handling a horse, I want to make sure that I'm taking into consideration my own safety, the safety of the people assisting me, and the safety of the horse. And so it's a good idea when you're handling a horse to first make sure that you have the rope in such a way that your body is not going to become accidentally entrapped in the rope. A good way to hold a horse is to be on the left side of their body, to have about six inches to a foot of rope um, between the first buckle on the bottom and your hand, and then allow the rope to come through your second hand and drape across your hand so that you have, you're holding the horse in a way that if it bolted, there's nothing that's gonna happen to any of your fingers, okay? A common mistake that I see people make is they will have this loop so big that they run the risk of entrapping their own foot in the loop. So you wanna make sure that you're doubling back. You can double back on the rope so that you're not dangling anything that you can step on. It's a good rule of thumb when you're leading a horse that you don't know to have a hand on that horse. If, it, if the horse is walking along and maintaining its distance, that's one thing. But if you find that the horse is crowding your space, oftentimes just keeping a hand on the horse will keep it at a safe distance from you. And that's probably the best way to do that. Note that I don't have anything entwined around my hand. That's a loose hold. The other thing to consider is that if you're reaching for the horse's head and you need to do something on their head, be sure that you don't put your finger through something that would cause your hand to become entrapped if the horse pulls back. Um, if I'm gonna move the horse away from me, I'm just gonna do a little bit of pressure and I can keep that horse at a distance. Some horses will threaten to bite if a horse is threatening to bite, you wanna make sure you have an experienced handler. That would be a situation where I would actually hold the horse's head away from me if it's trying to bite me. But again, if you have a horse that's trying to do that sort of behavior, make sure you involve an experienced hand. Oftentimes in an evacuation situation, the horse is gonna be adrenalized. They're gonna be looking at everything that's going on and it's really important that you keep their attention on you. If you have a horse, for example, that you're walking along and it's staring off behind you, it's going to likely jump forward away from whatever's bothering it. So you wanna be on the left side of the horse. You wanna have some sort of contact that keeps the horse at an arm's distance from you. And if the horse isn't paying attention, you need to ask for its attention. Horses are prey animals and they've evolved over millions of years to be able to monitor their horizon while they eat. And they rely on the cues of their herd mates and they have a keen sense of vision and hearing. And we need to take those things into consideration when we're working around them. <clears throat> a very important thing to consider in the horse is what their normal field of vision is. Because we wanna make sure that when we're approaching them that they can see us. Realize that horses have about a 10 degree wedge right in front of their head, between their eyes, where they have virtually no vision. It's called a blind spot. They have a similar 10 degree wedge directly behind them that has no vision. And so if you as a handler approaches a horse from directly in front or directly in behind, they will not see you. And 
unfortunately, they can have a reactive um, flight response if you suddenly appear into their field of vision. So our recommendation when approaching a horse is to be talking to them so that they can hear you and to be approaching their left shoulder at about a 45 degree angle to their body. That way you're well in their normal circumferential vision and they are used to being approached from the left side. We never want to do anything in the horse's blind spot and so we just are very careful to avoid that area. Realize that horses can use their head, their front foot, and their hind foot as a weapon. Most domesticated horses don't want to do this, but in an adrenalized situation or in a young and inexperienced animal, you need to be very careful about where you have your body. So again, when I talk about a safe zone in the horse, I'm talking about a wedge that exists from their left shoulder to just about, uh, I would say the forward part of their chest here, not mid abdomen, but a little bit farther forward. And the reason for that is that a horse can cow kick all the way to the center part of their abdomen. So if I have my body here, I'm relatively safe. If I have my body here, he can kick me. The other thing to realize about the way a horse is put together is that their front foot can only move forward and back. The horse's front limb has no lateral movement to it. And what I mean by that is they are able to strike forward, they are able to kick that limb backward, but they have no ability to move it to the side. So when we talk about a safe zone or a safe place to be when we're working on the front end of the horse, being just lateral to their left shoulder is a very safe place to be. When I'm working on them, I pay important attention about where my feet are and where my body is. I never want my foot somewhere where the horse can stamp my foot and I have good um, protective uh, footwear on right now, no open toe, no soft sneaker. I also never put my body directly in front of a horse. This is a place where a horse could really strike you very quickly, especially a young or inexperienced horse. Um, so you, you want to avoid getting in front of the horse. If you need the horse's head for something, you can pull the horse's head to your safe place as opposed to stepping into an unsafe place, if that makes sense. So lateral shoulder, I'm going to avoid the back part of the horse's body. If I need to travel around a horse for some reason, I'm either going to walk wide around the front end of the horse, or I'm going to keep my hand on the horse and stay close and walk behind, or I'm going to walk wide. It depends on your situation. If I'm not able to walk around the front of the horse for some reason and I need to walk around the back of the horse, there are two different ways to do it. <clears throat> if you don't know the horse and you have no experience with the horse, the smartest thing that you can do is walk a wide perimeter around the horse. Now realize for a fraction of that time you will be in the horse's blind spot. So a very good practice is to keep talking to the horse while you walk around. That way the horse can listen for you and you aren't going to startle it. So. Uh, in Sparky here, I'm going to walk around him. I'm going to say, you know what, Sparky, you're a good kid. I need to check out the right side of your abdomen, and I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to walk all the way to your shoulder, and then I'm going to come back to you. Notice that I did not walk around the back of Sparky and then start to approach him in his blind zone. I, you have, if you're going to walk around, you need to take the time to walk all the way around to the right shoulder and then come back in talking so that he knows what's going on. That's the safe way to go around a horse um, at a distance. <clears throat> if I need to stay close to a horse for some reason, there is also a safe way to do that. And when I do that, what I'm going to do <clears throat> is I'm going to keep the hand, my hand on this horse as I walk around this horse. And you notice that I don't lose contact with him at any point, okay? When I do this, I am keeping my knees bent and I am walking around with him in full contact. By staying close to the horse, you minimize the impact of a kick. 
Should he kick, you always want to be close to the hoof and not at the full arc of flight of that foot. Full arc of flight is going to generate much more power than being close with a nudge. It'll still hurt. Um, but again, if you have to stay close, you want to keep your body in contact. And this is a principle that we talk about when we're taking temperature too. You'll notice I've got my body against his bo body. I've got my knees bent. If he were to make a sudden movement, my hope is, is that my body being against his would allow me to re react away. Okay. So a good rule of thumb, close contact, let the horse know you're there and keep talking. I never duck underneath a horse's head for any reason. Uh, you don't want to duck underneath a tied horse. You don't want to duck underneath a horse that's being held for you. You always want to uh, choose the wide option around the front um, if you can. That's the safest way to come around to the other side of a horse. Whenever I'm working around a horse, I remember to keep my knees bent. It's a really important part of your safety. A strike or a kick to an extended knee is very likely to create a serious injury to your knee. If your knees are bent, he's helping me bend my knees. If your knees are bent, should you receive a blow, oftentimes it's going to send your knees in a direction that will still allow your knee to maintain its normal anatomy, meaning you aren't as likely to hyperextend or to have a catastrophic injury to your knee. So whenever you're working around a horse, remember to keep your knees slightly bent. And I try to, if I'm thinking about a kick zone, for example, I try to position myself so that if I were to take a blow, it would send my knee in a natural direction for my knee. So just be thinking about those things when you're working around horses. Knowing that Benny is able to kick all the way to this part of his body, if I am going to do something that involves listening to the back half of his body, for example, taking a gut motility assessment, oftentimes a safe thing to do, and you would have a handler with you, your handler would be assisting the front end, is to hold a little bit of mane. If you hold a little bit of mane and you keep your knees bent and you're listening back here, if the horse were to jump forward, you are anchored to the horse. The horse will pull you with it, if that makes sense. So holding a little bit of mane is a good idea when you have to work on an unfamiliar horse and you have to put part of your body into that kick zone. You'll notice my knees are bent. You'll notice my feet are out from underneath the horse. And you will notice that I am not stepping into an area where that horse can kick me. You will note in this training video that in several instances we do have our patient tied. And this is in the era of COVID-19. As we produce these videos, we are social distancing. However, if you're truly assessing a horse and working on an unfamiliar horse, it's really important that you do have an experienced handler assisting you, as some horses will react adversely to some of the procedures we're doing, and you don't want the horse to pull back, injure you, or injure itself. So again, uh, it's important to have a good experienced handler that you're working with when you are doing a head to tail assessment and it is possible to maintain social distancing and wear masks while you are performing the assessment. If a situation arises where you do need to tie a horse, <clears throat> you wanna really make sure and choose an area to tie the horse that is safe for the horse, such as a nice uh, tying post like this or to the side of a trailer. We never want to tie a horse to a structure that the horse can pull off of its foundation or off of its attachment and then drag behind the horse. And in most cases, in an adrenalized situation, whether that's evacuation or even shelter in place, don't tie the horse unless you absolutely have to. If you do, find a sturdy structure that is a safe uh, place to tie and you want to make sure and use a quick release knot um, to do that so that if the horse were to set back, you'd have a quick way to let that horse go. Beware of the structures over the top of the horse. Beware of any structures behind the horse because a sudden pullback can create a tremendous amount of force. And the last thing that you want to do is step into a horse that's pulling back. If you've set yourself up correctly, you have a rope that you can release at a distance. You never want to step in to the space between where the horse is pulling back 
and the structure that it's tied to. And today we're going to talk about taking a horse's vitals safely and how to get that done. And uh, when we first come up to a horse to take its vitals, we want to make sure that the horse is ready to have its vitals taken and willing. And so this is something that you wouldn't want to do on a horse that is really excited, that's showing adrenaline, that's calling for its neighbors or spinning around because you won't be able to keep yourself safe and quite honestly your vitals won't be accurate. That horse has adrenaline on board, you're not going to get an accurate assessment. When we talk about vitals we often want to describe the animal's mentation, meaning is he bright, alert, responsive? Is he looking around? Is he acknowledging you? Is he looking at his environment? This horse, this is Sparky, is nice and bright today. He's looking around and he's with me. He knows I'm here. Sometimes horses will call them quiet, alert and responsive, meaning they're here with us, but they're a little more dull. Their head will be down a notch or two and they'll be a little less uh, interactive with you. A horse that's depressed is a horse that's got its head usually hanging below the level of the withers and the horse is not really paying attention to you. Um, and so those are words that we'll use to describe the horse. Bright alert responsive, quiet alert responsive, or depressed. When we go to take their vitals, one of the first things that we want to do is get their heart rate. And again, it's important that the horse is in sort of a receptive state for this. You want to try and remain um, off to the left of the horse's shoulder. This is your safety zone in here. We never want to put ourselves right in front of a horse and we want to make, realize, be cognizant that a horse can kick all the way up to mid belly. So when I'm taking vitals, I'm going to put myself in the horse's safe zone at the left shoulder and I'm going to watch where my feet are so that I don't inadvertently put my foot somewhere where the horse might step on it. So there are multiple ways that you can get a horse's heart rate. One of the easiest ways is to reach for the artery that's on their face. It's called the facial artery and it sits exactly in the middle of the curve of their cheek. And if you let them know you're coming, you can reach in there and if you feel back and forth, you'll feel a ropey structure that's about the width of a pencil. If you put light pressure on that, you're gonna feel their pulse. And remember, a horse's heart rate is about half of ours, so be patient. Normal horses will usually be somewhere between 32 and 44. An excited horse or a horse with a fever will have a higher heart rate. So I'm gonna stand here, and I'm go you can see that I've got my body in a safe place. I'm reaching up, and then I'm gonna watch my watch, and I'm gonna count how many times I feel his pulse in a 10 second period, and I'm gonna multiply that by six and he's got a nice, low, steady heart rate today. The next area where you can get pulse, and this is kind of handy if you're looking from a distance, is the horse's carotid artery comes right out of its chest at the base of the jugular vein. So there's this nice, beautiful groove that comes all the way down, and the jugular vein and the carotid artery live in here, and right at the bottom, the carotid artery is very superficial. So if you have a horse that you need to look at from a distance or a horse that isn't really wanting you to touch it, this can be a very helpful way. I'm watching his carotid artery here. I can watch my clock and I can set the time to 10 seconds and note how many of the pulses I observe in a 10 second period and then I multiply that by six. Third way to get heart rate on a horse is to use a stethoscope. I recommend if you're going to be doing work with livestock that you obtain a stethoscope that has a longer arm on it so that you don't have to get your head quite as close to their body. Remember that when you put a stethoscope on, you need to have the little earbuds facing forward. If they're facing backwards, you're not gonna hear very well. So earbuds in, and then I'm gonna let the horse know that I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do. For the purposes of this, I'll take this out. I'm gonna pet him. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use my hand and my stethoscope and I'm gonna slide my stethoscope to where his heart is. Now remember, the horse's heart sits primarily under all this gigantic triceps musculature. The most common mistake people will make 
is they will place their stethoscope where they can see it. If you can see all of your stethoscope, you're not going to be able to hear the horse's heart. And so what we'll need to do is let the horse know we're coming, and then we're going to slide in, and we're actually going to move our stethoscope out of our view. If you can see your stethoscope, you're probably too far back and too low. A good rule of thumb is to go ahead and palpate the top of their elbow right here, come about a hand's breadth above that, and then place your stethoscope and move in underneath the heart. That's going to give you the best chance of hearing a horse's heart. Remember where your body is, so you've got yourself in the safe zone here, you've got your feet out from underneath the horse, you're going to lean in and bend your knees, and you're going to listen to their heart. Again, I would be watching my clock and I would do a 10 second period and count how many beats I'm going to hear in that, in that time period. Um, and so if you're having trouble hearing the heart, the most common thing is you're either too low or too far back. If the horse is, has its left front foot back, you can ask the horse to go ahead and move its foot forward and then you get a better ability to place your stethoscope. So that's a nice trick if you're having trouble. So again, in review, we can feel for the facial artery. We can look for the jugular groove and carotid artery, and we can take the heart rate using our stethoscope. To get a horse's resting respiratory rate, again, it's important that the horse is not adrenalized and that they're in whatever their relaxed environment is, okay? Using the horse's nostrils to get a respiratory rate doesn't tend to work very well. Horses are inquisitive, they're going to be sniffing at things, and you will be confused by nostril movement. Remember that a horse has a naturally comma-shaped nostril. So a horse that's not having any trouble breathing will have that comma shape. A horse that's having trouble breathing will have big round nostrils and usually they'll have a very worried look on their eye. It's scary to not be able to get enough air. And so in a horse that's having trouble, not only will you see big round nostrils, but you'll see the whites of their eyes. So if I'm going to get respiratory rate on a horse, the way I do it is I watch the horse's chest rise and fall. And remember, a horse's resting respiratory rate is only eight to 12 breaths per minute. It's much slower than for a human or for a companion animal. The best way to teach yourself to get respiratory rate is to actually put your stethoscope on the horse, right pretty close to where you're going to listen to the heart, and then watch the chest rise and fall. And in a 10 second period, you're gonna count how many times the chest rises and falls. And realize you're usually gonna get two or three chest rises in a 10 second period. It's, it's nice and slow. From a distance, you won't be able to tell a horse's respiratory rate because that movement is sort of subtle. So you do need to be relatively close and watch the chest rise and fall. The way that horses breathe, they move their chest in a very subtle fashion when they're healthy and at rest. So it can be, it can take some practice to learn how to take respiratory rate. When I'm going to take a horse's temperature, I I'm, I'm, have spoken with the person holding the horse. We are in tune, we're on the same side. And I am going to initially read the horse's body language. It is not worth taking a horse's temperature if the horse is showing any evidence of resistance. If the horse is excited, if it won't stand still, or if it's showing resistance behavior, do not take the temperature and wait for a trained um, professional to assist you. If the horse is willing to have its temperature taken, the safest way to do it is to run your hand along the horse so that the horse knows you're here. To insert the thermometer in, I make sure that I'm in a safe place that the horse knows I'm here and that he's receptive to the process. As I step in, I'm going to keep my knee, uh, knees bent and I'm going to keep my body relatively close to his body. I'm looking for any signs of resistance behavior. His ears are back because he's listening to me, but his ears are not pinned back. He's not swishing his tail and he's not offering to sit down before he wants to kick. So I'm going to lean in and I'm going to raise his tail. He's not resisting me. He's not clamping or swishing. 
I'm going to reach underneath and I'm just going to tap on his rectum to see what his response is. A resistant horse is going to clamp that tail back down, they're going to swish their tail, or they're going to sit down a little bit. He's not doing any of those things. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to insert my thermometer into his rectum. And once I've got the thermometer in, I've got my knees bent, I'm against the horse, and I'm going to hold it until the thermometer indicates that it has a temperature, until it beeps at me. Normal temperature in a horse is anywhere from 99 to 100.5. On a hot day, we give them one degree, so they can be up to 101.5 on a hot day. If you get a reading that's below 99, it's usually because you have the tip of your thermometer inserted into some manure in the rectum, and that's going to read a little bit cooler. If the temperature is below 98, that would be a reason to check in with your supervisor or above 101. Let's talk for a moment about dehydration. Dehydration is one of the most common precursors to colic in horses. And we see a fair amount of dehydration in uh, disasters and evacuation situations. So it's helpful to have a, what I call a five point assessment for hydration. The first point is mentation. We talk a lot about this in horses. Dehydrated mammals, whether it's a human or a horse, uh, any, any animal that's dehydrated is going to show depressed behavior once that dehydration hits a certain point. It might be your teammate in the truck with you, but today we're going to talk about a horse. So a horse, the first thing, if I'm asking myself, is this horse dehydrated or not? The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at mentation. Bright, alert, responsive. This horse is showing normal mentation. So that's the first sign that his hydration is probably okay. The next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look, I'm gonna let him know I'm coming, I'm in the safe zone, and I'm just gonna flip up his gum and I'm gonna push right over his tooth with my finger. What I notice is that his gums are bubblegum pink, they're moist, and when I push in, the color comes back within one second. And that's called capillary refill time. And the moistness, of his gums, the color of his gums, and the return of color after uh, compression tells me that he has a good hydration level. And again, I'm gathering data. So mentation's good, capillary refill time is good. The next thing I'm gonna do is look at his jugular fill time. In a normal horse <clears throat> that's well hydrated, when I hold off his jugular vein, that jugular is going to rise immediately out of the furrow. Notice where my body is. Remember that some horses aren't going to want their jugular held off because they're needle shy. So if you have one when you reach for the jugular that it starts to get upset, just skip this step. But it's a very nice way to see that this horse has good jugular fill. What you're going to want to do is hold off their jugular furrow with both sides of your hand so that you're holding off both sides and you can see that when I do that and let go that jugular vein fills right up instantly and consumes that space. If you just do one side you'll notice it's a little bit slower so go ahead and use both. Realize that some horses are not going to want you to hold off their jugular vein in anticipation of a needle so if the horse starts shaking its head just skip this step. The next thing I'm going to look at is skin turgor on the horse. Make sure that when you check this that you're right over the shoulder blade and all you need to do is take a pinch of the skin and let go. If I just do a little pinch you can see that his skin goes right back flat after I let go. Up here you get a more variable pinch because he's got extra skin. So the best, most consistent place is going to be right over the shoulder blade where you have tension. So now I've seen good mucous membrane color and capillary refill time. I've seen good jugular fill. I have a bright horse. I've got good skin tent. The last thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to listen for gut motility. 
And in the horse, gut motility is actually the most sensitive indicator of hydration. Their motility will start to fall before these other parameters change. When I'm listening to gut motility on the horse, I need to remember that a horse can kick all the way to mid thorax. So I need to let the horse know that I'm coming with my stethoscope. It's a mistake to just walk up and put your stethoscope on a horse. It's a good way to get yourself kicked. So when I listen for gut motility, again, I'm gonna place my stethoscope with earbuds facing forward. I've got my knees bent. I'm gonna let him know I'm coming. And then I'm gonna go ahead and listen. In the horse, there are four quadrants where we listen for gut motility. This is the upper quadrant on the left. Once I've listened, usually within three seconds of placing my stethoscope, I should hear a small gurgle. If you're not used to what that's like, you can practice on your own stomach and listen. So stethoscope on, I hear a small gurgle, I'm gonna move down and I'm gonna listen to the left lower quadrant. Again, keeping myself in a safe spot. Once I've done that, I'm gonna walk around the front of the horse and I'm going to listen to the right side, upper quadrant and lower quadrant. And again, in a normal horse, I should hear gut motility within about three seconds of placing my stethoscope. If you have to wait longer than six seconds to hear gut motility, then we would call it uh, absent in that quadrant. And what I mean by that is when we're talking about gut motility, we will say it's present, it's slight, or it's absent, okay? So present, you're gonna hear it within three seconds. Um, slight may, might mean that you hear it every six seconds. Uh, absent means you don't hear it at all, even if you keep your stethoscope on there for 10 or 15 seconds. And so oftentimes we will grade gut motility. And remember that this is the most sensitive indicator of hydration. If you arrive on scene and there is no water available to the horse, that would be a reason to check in with your leader and to consult a veterinarian. Horses need approximately 10 to 12 gallons of water a day uh, to drink to have normal gut function. In hot weather, that number can go up to 20 gallons a day, depending on the horse's size and activity level. And lack of water is one of the number one predisposing factors to colic. If there's no water on scene, you have to be careful about how you reintroduce water. And that would be something that you would wanna check in with your team leader about. If they have no water, our rule of thumb is that you can start with one three gallon bucket of water, allow them to consume that, wait about 20 minutes, and then go ahead and offer them a second bucket of water. That horse is likely to need some veterinary attention if it's been without water for more than 12 hours. This would be a good time, if you discover a horse like that, to do your five point hydration assessment. And if any one of those five points is abnormal, then we involve a veterinarian in the discussion. We would introduce food the same way. If you happen upon a shelter in place situation where there has been no hay, you want to be very careful about the amount of hay you offer to that horse. If there is hay on site, you can go ahead and offer a half a flake of hay, wait a little bit, and then slowly work them back into hay using a veterinarian's consult to guide you in how much to give, depending on what the horse's situation is. When we're performing a head to tail assessment on a horse, again, we wanna start from a distance to look at them. Remember that horses are prey animals. They're gonna change how they're holding themselves and how they're behaving the moment they detect your presence. Um, weakness is vulner vulnerability to a prey animal, so you can learn a lot by observing for, from a distance before you move in. And one of the main things I look at, again, is mentation. Is the horse bright? Is he alert? Is he with his herd? Is he doing a similar thing as the rest of his herd? So for example, if the rest of his herd is standing up and eating and, you, and he is laying down, that would make me want to question, why is the horse laying down when everybody else is eating? Or if the horse is off by itself 
um, those that would warrant further investigation. So from a distance, I see that the horse is bright and alert. I see that he has his four legs underneath him. He's resting that left hind, which they will do at times, but prey animals want to be able to move at a moment's notice. So a normal horse with normal neurologic status who's not in pain is going to have its four limbs relatively underneath its body. It's not uncommon for horses at rest to rest one of their limbs. And as you can see, his right hind limb is cocked forward. And oftentimes they will rest a limb for a while and then they will switch to another limb. And so in and of itself, a resting limb is not something to be too worried about. If I was doing a head to tail assessment of a horse and I saw him resting that leg, I would ask him to move forward. And as you can see, he's actually bearing full weight on that limb. So he was just resting it. It's not that it was injured. That's what we want. We always want that. <laughs> The other thing I look at is, are they comfortable? I look at the face. Horse's face tells you a lot about their comfort level. Remember that a horse's nostrils are comma shaped. Their eyes should have a normal, rounded look to it. He's a little nervous. You can see there's a little peak in his eye. And his ears are responsive. He's listening to what's going on in his environment. I look at where his head is. Most horses are gonna hold their head at the level of their withers or above, especially if they detect somebody coming in or if they're listening. A horse that's resting will sometimes have its head lower than its withers, but usually they will perk up when they realize that somebody's on the property or something's going on. A depressed horse will often have its head at the level of withers or below and not really move the head when you approach. That's something to consider. Horses have a very muscular, flexible neck. When they hear something going on, they should be able to turn their whole neck and head to look at what's going on. If you approach a horse and it's standing in a uh, sort of parked out and it has to move its whole body to look at you, that's an indication that that horse is experiencing some neck pain that may or not be a new condition, but it's something that we just need to be aware of if the horse has arthritis. I look at the contour of their belly. A comfortable horse has a relaxed, rounded belly. We're not seeing what we call a tucked up appearance where they're pulling their caudal abdomen up. We're not seeing any kind of what we call heave line or muscle contraction in there. And so that is a comfortable abdominal stance. Likewise, he's got a comfortable top line stance. He's not roaching his back. He's not parking out. His body is in a state of relaxation. The wonderful thing about looking at a horse's limbs and trying to decide are they injured or is there something seriously wrong is that you've got two of each. You've got one to compare to the other in front and likewise in back. So when I'm looking, again, from a distance, trying to assess, can I just load this horse up or does this horse need some additional care? I can compare the size of the feet and I can send my eyes up the limb and look for symmetry. And as long as those structures are looking symmetrical, it's unlikely that you have a serious injury. There's no swelling, he's comfortable, and I see symmetrical distal limbs in front. When I look to the hind end, I see the same thing. I'm looking for symmetry of feet, fetlocks, hocks, and I'm looking up his limb, and I'm not seeing any overt swelling any reluctance to bear weight. I'm not seeing any wounds on his body that might need more attention. Let's do a quick review of the anatomy of the horse just so that you can better communicate to your team leader what you've seen. Remember that the horse has multiple joints coming up the limb with the lowest joint being only inches off the ground, which is the coffin joint, which sits inside the horse's foot. So if I'm gonna communicate what I'm looking at, remember that we have hoof, coronary band, pastern, fetlock, cannon bone. This is the carpus. Many people call this the knee, and you can call it the knee, just call it the front knee. Remember that a true knee is going to have a kneecap, 
So the true knee in the horse is the stifle in the back. But you can call this the knee, just call it the front knee or call it the carpus. This is forearm, elbow, shoulder is here, this is his shoulder blade, and this is his withers, okay? If we go down the back end of a horse, we'll start up top. Pelvis sits up here, okay, his pelvis is in this area. This is part of his pelvis, that's called the tubercoxae. His actual hip joint sits over here under a lot of muscle. This is the stifle joint. Horses don't like to have this joint touched, so I don't recommend that you reach in to touch this joint, but you can see that he's got a kneecap here. This is called the gaskin. This is the limb between the stifle joint and the hock. This is the horse's hock. Looks sort of like an elbow behind. Cannon bone, fetlock joint, pastern, coronary band, hoof. So if you need to communicate to your team leader that you're seeing a wound or a swelling, it's helpful to know that anatomy. And I always want to pay more attention to a wound that sits over the top of a joint. Because in horses, their joints are very superficial to the skin. Sometimes there's only millimeters protecting. And a wound that enters a horse's joint is a very serious situation that often involves referral for more advanced care. So if I'm seeing any kind of injury over a joint, or if I see one really large joint, it's not a bad idea to use your digital camera, take a picture of what you're seeing, report what you're seeing to your team leader, and if there's any question, that image can be sent to a veterinarian for a consult if you don't have anybody on site. When we're looking at a horse's head, again, we can use symmetry to really help us to decide if there's anything that we need to be worried about or consult a veterinarian about. If you look at his nostrils, you can see that there is no food, there's no nasal discharge, there's no blood coming out of these nostrils. They're pretty symmetrical. And again, they're relatively comma shaped. He's not struggling to breathe. And so that's a pretty normal um, appearance. He's a little worried about me, but um, nostrils are in good shape. If I look at his eyes, I'm gonna compare one eye to the other. His eyes are open, they're clear, there's no blue or white discoloration to the eye itself, and there's no tearing or clamping. A horse that's clamping an eye or tearing from an eye is a horse that needs to see a veterinarian. If you're evacuating that horse, it can come on in and be assessed at the shelter. If this is a shelter in place animal, then you would want to take a digital picture, bring it to the attention of your team leader and get a veterinary consult get that horse seen. Eyes are very, very sensitive in horses and they're time sensitive. So an eye isn't something that you want to wait till the next day to take care of. You'd want somebody to take a look at that eye promptly. If you look at his ears, his ears are um, listening to his environment. Again, they're symmetrically placed on his head and there is no blood or discharge coming out of his ears. You can learn a lot about a horse from their ear position. This horse is listening to some hay that's being unloaded behind him. So his ears are back, but it doesn't mean that he's resentful of what I'm doing. It means he's listening. And oftentimes you will see ears move forward and back with sound. Um, a horse that's depressed will often have its head low and its ears down and to the side. And if you try to stimulate that horse, then usually if they are not depressed, they're going to brighten up and look at you. A depressed horse isn't really going to change its facial expression when you stimulate the horse. Horses can use their ears asymmetrically, so they can have one ear pointing forward to listen to what's going on in front of them, and one ear just as he's doing, and one ear back to, to what's behind. And again, that's normal. Where I pay more attention from a safety perspective is when a horse puts its ears back and flattens them on their head like a cat. Flattened ears usually is signaling that the horse does not like what you're doing and often means that the horse is going to do something about it. So pay attention to flattened ears, but don't worry too much if the ears are moving and listening to what's going on. When we're referring to structures on a horse's head, remember that 
we're going to use their laterality, meaning his left. So if we're talking about a squinting eye, it's, if it's this eye, it's the left eye. Many people have the propensity when they're standing in front of them to call it the right eye, but we're always going to refer to the horse's anatomy. So when we're talking about the face, again, we've got muzzle, and this is his corner of his mouth. You can see he doesn't like that, but he's not doing anything that makes me worried about his behavior. We're also going to call, uh, you know, this is the eye area, ear. The area at the top of the head between the ears is called the pole. Many horses are worried about you touching their pole, or they can be ear shy. So if the horse shows resentment, that's okay. Don't make any big motions towards the head. Pole, this is the throat latch area in here. We call this the cheek. This is the jugular furrow, and these are the withers. Horses have a relatively symmetrical diagonal gait. And if you're trying to decide if the horse is sound enough to load up or is comfortable enough in a shelter in place situation, a good rule of thumb is to have one of your experienced teammates walk the horse and just make sure that there's no overt head bob or that the horse is not uncoordinated. I'm gonna walk him a few steps and you can see that he's bearing relatively similar weight on all four limbs. You'll notice that I'm looking where I'm going. I have my hands appropriately positioned. And if you watch him walk, you'll see that he's bearing equal weight on all four limbs. He does not have a head bob. He does not have a limp. And this is a good way to just evaluate the horse before you load them up. Can they walk a figure eight? And are they comfortable and bearing symmetrical weight on all four limbs? Oftentimes, horses that are not wearing shoes will be a little sensitive on gravel, and that we take into consideration. But an overt head bob or a non-weight-bearing lameness is something that warrants further investigation. Let's remember, in an evacuation situation, we do not have time to be doing assessments on horses. However, we do need to make sure they're fit to load. There are a few circumstances under which a horse would not be fit to load. One would be if the horse is in respiratory distress. If the horse has flared nostrils and is having trouble breathing, you can see the whites of his eyes, or if you can hear the breathing, meaning you're hearing what's called strider. Oftentimes that'll be when they inhale, you're gonna hear sort of a noise. If you're hearing that repeatedly, that's telling you that they have some form of airflow obstruction and the stress of loading up could make that worse. So difficulty breathing, that's a no load. You gotta figure out what you're doing there. Second thing that would be a no load is if you have a horse that is only bearing weight on three limbs. If they have a limb that they will not bear weight on, especially if that limb is much more swollen than the other one, at least twice as swollen as the other one, we need to investigate why before we load that horse up. Now, obviously, if there's a fire coming, that's a, that's a, a difficult call. But if you have time, you need to investigate that because if the horse does have a fracture and you load it, you could really make that fracture worse. A good rule of thumb is if that left front is swollen and I'm not sure, I'm gonna just, if it's safe to do it, pick up the right front for a second. If the horse is willing to bear full weight on the left front, that's a good situation. The other thing you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna pick up the limb that they're having trouble bearing weight, if they'll let you, and look in the foot to make sure there's not a nail or a structure in there. If you have time in an emergency evacuation and the horse is showing evidence of a wound that has overt bleeding, either arterial bleeding or significant venous bleeding, you do want to stop and secure that situation before you load the horse onto a trailer. The rule of thumb 
is that arterial bleeding is going to show a pulsed like activity. So you're going to actually see blood spurting out with force. That means an artery is involved and that means that we need to get a pressure wrap on there before we load the horse. If you've got a venous bleed, you're going to see a steady flow of blood, but it's not going to be spurting. A venous bleed with steady flow needs a pressure wrap before the horse gets on the trailer. And again, you've got to make sure it's safe to do that. The horse needs to be calm. They shouldn't be adrenalized. We're not going to try and put a wrap on a horse that's dancing around or worried about where its friends are. And there are things that you can do to decelerate that scene. Bring a friend over. Offer a little bit of hay. Get the horse to focus up on what's going on right next to it while someone with experience safely places a pressure wrap. If the horse has a wound that's just dripping blood, like a leaky faucet, you can load up. Other wounds with more serious bleeding, you need to stop and control the bleed. If you come across a horse in the field who is experiencing serious bleeding, that would be a situation where you want to stop and try and stabilize the patient if you can. There are different types of bleeding in the horse and realize that an average size horse has about 10 gallons of blood in their body. So you may find a pool of blood around the horse and it may look horrifying to you, but in most cases, horses are pretty effective at cutting off excessive bleeding with their own clotting processes. <clears throat> in the limb, the arteries and veins are very close to the surface. And so there will be circumstances under which you approach a horse that has bleeding from a vein. When a horse is bleeding from a vein, you will see a steady flow of blood and it will just continue to flow. If a horse is bleeding from an artery, you will actually see a pulsatile squirting of blood. Arterial blood pressure is much higher than venous blood pressure, so vein is going to flow, arteries going to squirt. Both venous and arterial bleeding need to be stopped before you load a horse up, if at all possible. Um, if a horse has a wound that's just dripping, like a leaky faucet, that is something that is usually on its own way to stopping. If you have time to put some pressure on it and a wrap on it, great. If you don't, I'm not as worried about that type of bleeding. If the horse has a serious bleed on its trunk somewhere, often what I, we recommend is we have your evacuation kits and in your evacuation kits there are first aid materials. You're going to want a handler holding the horse, you're going to want to minimize adrenaline. Remember that adrenaline and high blood pressure will perpetuate bleeding. So if there are measures you can take to bring the adrenaline down, beautiful. Those include putting a little bit of food in front of the horse, bringing a buddy over, making sure that the horse is as calm as it can be, and always safety is your number one concern. If the horse is too adrenalized to stay still or too agitated to let you near the wound, it is not risk worth risking your own safety. That's when you want to talk to your supervisor and get an experienced person in that can assist in getting the animal stabilized if you have time to do so. Trunk bleeding is very similar in an animal as it is in a human. Basically, what you want to do is have all of your materials together in a small bucket or something that you can have close to you to get this done. You want to take a small pad of either some gauze 4x4s or believe it or not, a baby diaper um, can work very well for this situation. And we have a baby diaper here. A baby diaper folded on itself or a little stack of gauze 4x4s will allow you to create enough pressure in most situations to slow down or stop a bleed. As with humans, if your wound is here, what you're going to do is take clean materials, you're going to use your other hand to stabilize, and you're going to put pressure on that wound. You'll notice that I am not in the strike zone of the horse. I have my knees bent. Another way to do that is like this, but you want to make sure that you have pressure on both sides, not just on the wound, but on the other side of the horse's neck. And steady pressure for a two minute period to three minute period is usually enough to slow things down. Once you've got uh, bleeding slowed down, you can replace your gauze mat with another clean one before hauling. And then you can go ahead 
and leave that pressure wrap on the horse. And you can apply, and you may need assistance doing this from a, your handler, you can apply a neck wrap that will come around and position that padding where you want it to go. <clears throat> you can use some elasticon or tape or even duct tape to secure that in place and then load the horse up. So for truncal bleeding, you initially want to apply steady pressure until you get it to slow down, replace your mat with a clean new mat, thick net mat, and then try to secure it in place. The neck, the head are, are places that works. Obviously on the trunk, you're going to be hard pressed to keep anything on the horse's trunk for the trailer ride. Sometimes duct tape around a mat is your friend and you can try that, but the trunk is notoriously difficult place to apply wrap. If I need to place a wrap on a horse's distal limb that's bleeding significantly, again, I'm want, gonna wanna have a good experienced handler um, with me doing this work on my same side. The handler can help hand you materials as well, although I always think it's a good idea to have all of your materials ready to go, including a pair of scissors to go ahead and cut um, your bandage material once you're finished. Again, you'll notice I'm in the horse's safe zone. I'm off to the left uh, shoulder and I am using my knees and I'm staying where I am very mobile. I'm not kneeling, I'm not sitting. I'm gonna squat down. I'm gonna let the horse know I'm coming. I already have my wrap material ready to go. Gloves can make it very difficult to wrap. So while you place your initial pressure, you should have gloves on. If you're having trouble, you can remove your gloves to finish your wrap. Say the wound is here. I've got myself off to the side. I'm placing my telfas. This is called brown gauze. It's gonna secure the pressure onto the area that I want pressurized. I'm gonna use my scissors to cut my gauze. In a situation like this, I would use a little bit of Elasticon. And again, I recommend when you're wrapping an animal, once you've placed the sterile component, you can remove your gloves. <clears throat> little bit of Elasticon to secure your telfa in place. And again, our goal in stopping the bleed is to triage the situation so we can get the horse to where a veterinary professional can look at it. We're not cleaning the wound. We're not doing any of that work. We're just getting the horse to a safer place. You can often use a standing wrap once you've played this, this wrap. If you're familiar with placing these, again, I've got myself off to the side. So if the horse does strike forward, he can't hit me. This wrap is ready to go. I'm always gonna place my wrap in the same direction. My wrap materials are gonna start on the inside of the leg and they're always gonna go forward. And I'm gonna hold the front while I tighten the back, hold the back while I tighten the front. You'll notice I'm not tightening across the limb. I'm not shifting my wrap or twisting my wrap. In fact, by holding the back and holding the front, I'm ensuring that I am not twisting the wrap on the horse's limb to create a bandage bow. And again, this is a great way to stabilize a horse for a trailer ride in to where they can be triaged by a veterinary professional. This noise can be a little scary to a horse, so be careful when you're using Velcro. And oftentimes if I'm putting a horse on a trailer, I will place a piece of duct tape over this attachment so that it doesn't come undone in the trailer. In addition to stabilizing the front of the wrap and the back of the wrap while I pull this wrap tight, I'm wanting to create steady pressure, but I'm not pulling so tight that I'm creating a tourniquet situation for this horse. So I do want a, a good secure wrap, but again, I'm not putting a bunch of pressure on this limb at this point. The thick padding that we put underneath is what's creating the pressure. This is gonna protect the limb until we get the horse in uh, to where it can be assessed. Horses are naturally very well coordinated and they are able to navigate hills, steps up into trailers, that sort of thing. A horse with severe neurologic impairment, one that looks drunk to you, that is swaying in the front or swaying in the back and appears uncoordinated, is not safe to load and 
does require a more experienced hand. Again, in an evacu emergency evacuation situation, you'd want to make sure that there were no other horses in the trailer, and you would want to make sure that you've got an experienced hand that's going to load a neurologic horse. If you have time to wait and get that horse assessed and get the most experienced hands, that is the way to go. When we're looking at the symmetry of the front legs, we do need to take a moment to look at their chest, their pectoral muscles up here. Make sure that those are also symmetrical. In the summer months when fire activity is high, we also see more pigeon fever, which is an infectious disease that can affect these muscles and you might see one that's much more swollen than the other. That horse can still be evacuated, but we'll make some special plans for where that horse is, goes into evacuation. Pigeon fever tends to affect the uh, pectoral muscles and the belly, as well as the sheath. So any swelling or asymmetry notable along the chest or the belly or sheath should be reported to your team leader. After a large disaster, the most common thing that we see in horses is colicky behavior. And it's important to be able to recognize what colic looks like in a horse. It can be as subtle as a horse not finishing a meal or not coming up to eat. So if you are in a shelter situation and you notice that the horse is not eating at dinner time, or if you are out in shelter in place and you notice that all the other horses are eating but one isn't or one walks away, that would be a reason to talk to your team leader, collect some vitals, and report in to a veterinarian. Colic can vary in the severity of signs. A horse that is getting up and down numerous times, pawing, rolling, looking at its side, stretching out, biting at its flank or looking at its flank, those are all different signs of colic. A horse that's overtly sweating, that can be a more serious sign of colic. So if you're seeing colicky behavior and sweating, be sure to report that to, the, to your team leader as well. Any colicky horse, whether it's mild depression and not eating all the way up to a overt severe colic should be seen by a veterinary professional. It's not uncommon to come across wounds in evacuation and shelter in place situations because horses will run into objects when they're uh, moving away from perceived danger. A wound over any of the joints, as we've discussed, is something that needs a veterinary consult. A good rule of thumb for trying to decide whether or not a wound needs stitches is for you to take your hand and put your fingers, clean fingers, ideally gloved fingers, on either side of a wound. And if you can separate the skin edges by moving your fingers apart and see the underlying tissue, that is something that likely needs stitches. When in doubt, take a digital picture, get it to your team leader, and your team leader will check in with the veterinarian to arrange for veterinary care either in the field or at the shelter. In disaster situations, especially after a fire has come through, it's not unusual for a horse to have nails or penetrating objects in its foot or in different parts of its body. When you're doing a head to tail assessment, if you notice that there is an object stuck in a joint or in the skin, Again, that is a great time to take a digital picture of that limb and to go ahead and send that to your supervisor for a veterinary consult. It's also a good time to take a horse's vitals. If you find a penetrating wound, um, it would be very helpful for the vet consulting veterinarian to know if the horse is running a fever or if the horse has other abnormalities on your assessment. If you need to do a visual inspection of a horse's foot, there is a safe way to get that done. And oftentimes, if you come across a horse in the shelter or in the field that is limping, it's important to be able to look at the bottom of the horse's foot. Again, we always approach to the left shoulder. We let the horse know we're coming. I've got approved footwear on. I'm not putting my body into a place where he can step on me. I'm off to the side. I'm gonna reach down the limb, I've got bent knees, and I'm gonna pick that foot up. <clears throat> Notice where my head is. If you do this, you have just put your head into the kick zone. 
So when you're picking out a horse's feet, you want to be off to the side, knees bent. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to come into the um, grooves of the frog and I'm going to look, inspect the foot. Notice that I've got a loose hold here. If he slams his foot down, he's not going to slam his foot onto my foot. And if he does anything uh, that, that where he wants to yank his foot away, that can easily happen because I've got the foot cradled in my hand. So again, in review, let the horse know you're coming. You've got bent knees. You've got the hoof cradled in your hand. And you have not put your head in a place where he can either hit it with his foot or hit you with his hind foot. And I'm going to go ahead and inspect the grooves of the frog here. And I'm going to inspect the sole. The coffin joint sits in the middle third of the frog only about an inch off the ground. If there is any penetrating object in the foot, a nail going in anywhere into the frog, take a digital picture of that. Do not attempt to pull it. Put the full foot down and make a phone call to your supervisor for veterinary assistance. The reason that we don't pull a nail when we find it in the foot is that it's very valuable for the veterinarian to be able to take a radiograph and assess exactly where that nail goes. If we pull the nail, then we take away that bit of important evidence. If the nail is very significantly penetrating out and you're worried that the horse is going to drive the nail farther in, take a picture of where the nail was, get a Sharpie or something to mark the spot where you pull the nail. But if at all possible, wait to pull a nail until you've consulted with a veterinarian. So let's review conditions under which we want to no-go or stop and make sure that we're triaging the horse correctly. And of course, always err on the side of caution. If you can get a picture out to a veterinary professional before you make a decision or to your team leader, do it. It's one of the beautiful things about technology. So if you come across a horse that is non-weight bearing, or will only toe touch and has a significantly swollen limb or a dangling limb. That is a no-go. You have to stop what you're doing and you have to get somebody out there uh, that can get that leg stabilized and that's going to involve a veterinary professional. If you come upon a horse that has significant venous or arterial bleeding, constant bleeding, that is a no-go. You need to stop and stop the bleed. Direct pressure is the way to get that done, but again, your safety is paramount. Make sure that you have a good handler and that you can get that done effectively. If you come across a horse that is uncoordinated, drunk looking, ataxic, where it doesn't seem to know where its own feet are or it's staggering, that's a no-go. Get some help, get an experienced person out there, and if you're going to load that horse, that horse needs to go into a trailer by itself so it doesn't injure the other animals in that trailer, if at all possible. A horse that's been seriously burned down through the skin where you can see underlying tissues, or a horse that's profoundly depressed from burn and has edema on its body is a horse that should be assessed by a veterinarian before loading, if at all possible. And again, a digital picture can help a veterinary professional guide you in that situation. Those are the main reasons that we would not want to load a horse are those specific scenarios. There will be others that we haven't covered in this video. And uh, when in doubt, consult your team leader, get the, get the opinion of a veterinary professional so that you can make the safest choice for you, for your teammates, and for the horse. If you arrive on scene to a horse that is down and unable to rise, uh, that can be a very dangerous situation for you and for the horse. So a horse that's down and won't rise with a coax or a cluck or the jiggle of some food or grain is a horse that should be left in sight and uh, a veterinary professional should be consulted. Do not try to take vitals on a down horse. Do not go anywhere near the head or legs of a down horse. Um, the safest possible thing to do is to leave it be, lower the scene, make sure it can see a buddy and, uh, and get some experienced help. In disasters, in evacuation, shelter in place, and in the shelter, 
you will see many different manifestations of trauma. When in doubt, consult with your team leader and the team leader can make a decision whether or not to involve a veterinarian. The main important thing to remember is that you stay safe, that you keep your teammates safe, and that the horse is safe as well. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and I encourage you to practice some of these techniques at home. There's no way that we can cover all of the scenarios that you're likely to see in the field, but hopefully you have some good tips to make an assessment and to involve a veterinary professional if you have any question about the horse's health or safety. If you have horses at home, I encourage you to put together a first aid kit that contains many of the uh, materials that we used in this video so that you have the ability to triage your own animals at home or on the way to shelter should they experience some sort of accident.